what I'm fixing to read is a family history dictated by my grandfather, Peter Kroger. This is not for everybody. This is mainly a record for my family and for posterity's sake or family, friends, or historians. Coffee. So the house behind me is the house they built when they moved outside of town. I'll start with the family tree. So my great-grandfather was named Frank Kroger. He was from northern Germany slash Prussia slash Austria area, but primarily northern Germany. Actually, he's my great-great-great-grandfather. Um, don't know anything beyond that. His name was Frank Kroger. He married Sophie Tacky, who was from the same area. They produced, for sure, at least the child that we know of, which was my grandfather, Henry Kroger. There may have been other siblings that either got split up from the rest of the family. We don't really know, because my great-grandfather came to America, into Galveston, with his mother to live with his mother's brother, a John Tacky, and his wife. Actually, his uncle was Captain John Tacky. He had a schooner and went back and forth between Galveston, back and forth all the way into Florida, trading and such. Moved, having a uh, tripod issues, still am. So this is titled Memory, Memories. When we lived in San Luis Potosi, I remember living in a part of town called the Tlaxcala. So I note, I looked that up, there is an area in the historical district of San Luis Potosi in Mexico called the Barrio de Tlaxcala, and I may not be pronouncing that right. Um, the buildings cannot be changed except for the modern updates on the inside. They lived in a house that had a big backyard with mesquite trees and cactus plants. I have, must have been around four years old, which would be, I mean, it would be about 1904 because he was born in 1900. And my brothers, John and Henry, were younger. My mother kept a few chickens in the backyard, and I remember my brother John crawling on all fours under the cactus to collect the chicken eggs in a little wicker basket and take them to my mother. That's about all I remember of that place. Later on, we moved to a place in town called the Montecillo. That's not too far away. In a house which was nice, had several rooms, a patio, and a small backyard. It was on Athon Street. My father was promoted to master mechanic and bought this other house so he could be closer to the railroad shops and the railroad station. We were also one block from the Alameda Park. Also one block from the girls' elementary school. In this school, they also had a kindergarten department for little boys and girls. This was a public school. When I was about five years old, my mother enrolled me in kindergarten, so I learned my ABCs in Spanish. After that, I was placed in a private English school operated by the wife of some professional man. This school was out the Plaza de Armas way. Boys and girls went to this school. Then we, I say we because my brother's with me this time, were enrolled in a private Catholic English school. It was operated by Father de Rivas. This school was on the south side of the Alameda Park. This was a boys' school. It was at this school that one of the boys picked on my brother John, so they decided to have it out after school. They went around the block behind the schoolhouse and were having a real boxing match. They were coming about even when all of a sudden they were, there showed up one of the school teachers and the fighting was stopped and the next day we were punished by staying after school and riding only roosters fight 500 times. After this, we went back to the Colegio Inglés of San Francisco Way. 
which we had already attended before going to the Father Dereba School. The Collegio Anglais was a private school also operated by sort of a missionary bunch of teachers. They used the Bible as one of the textbooks. Miss Cunningham was the Bible teacher, Miss Lesser was study hall teacher, and Miss Molly was the principal. They also started school with prayer every day. Boys and girls went to school together. Some of the pupils we went to school with were the Dr. Tanguma children, the Hoppers, our neighbors, Cecilia Bueno, and the Dutes girls, owners of a large hardware plant in San Luis. The children of Attorney Sanchez, La Chata, Carlitos, and Federico, the Engelmans who operated a furniture store, a girl by the name of Maritza, Francis Willard, and others whose names I don't recall. Some of the children rode Shetland ponies to school. 1910 was Mexico's first centenary celebration of independence. While we were living in this house, we survived some revolutionary invasions. Fortunately, there wasn't any fighting because the governor always surrendered the town. The revolutionaries would stay a while and then move on. On one of those occasions, we prepared for a long siege. My mother bought some slabs of bacon, some ham, flour, rice, and beans, etc. There was no refrigeration in those days. So we put all the groceries in a large box with some mothballs, supposedly to keep the stuff from, <laughs> it's cold, from spoiling. Excuse me. So they put the stuff in this box because there's no refrigeration, supposedly to keep it from spoiling. So you can imagine what happened. We could never eat the stuff. In 1910, before the revolutionary trouble started, Haley's Comet appeared in the skies. My father had us climb to the top of the roof of the house so we could see the comet at night. It was a beautiful sight to behold and very awe-inspiring. I heard people talking that the comet meant there was there was going to be a lot of wars. It wasn't long after that Francisco J. Madero started the ball rolling by campaigning against President Porfirio Diaz. I was at the station one day when Madero came in on a passenger train and was making some speeches at the rear of the train when the police came and arrested him. I don't know how long the authorities held him. It seems to me that was the spark of the revolutions. Madero became president, but was assassinated. General Huerta became president and was assassinated. Venustiano Carranza became president too and was assassinated. Other revolutionary leaders were Pancho Villa, Zapata, Orozco, and others that were nothing but bandits. When Porfirio Diaz was dethroned as president, he had been president for 34 years. He went to Paris, France to live and get away from it all. He died in France. According to my father, Porfirio Diaz was a Mason and took the Shriners in the same class of novices my father was in. So they became Shriners together in Anazeth Temple of Mexico City, DF. Or as they say, DF, DFA. When we came back to the United States, my father transferred to the Arabia Temple in Houston, Texas. I might as well tell you here how my father got started in railroading. His uncle John Tacky heard about a new railroad shop being built in Corpus Christi, Texas. So on his next trip to Corpus Christi and one of his schooners, he got a job with the railroad, leaving him in charge of uncle uncle, as in not a real uncle, but they called him that, Tom Milan, who took him under his wing and eventually made a machinist out of him. This was on the Texas Mexican Railroad, which ran between Corpus Christi and Laredo, Texas. The starting pay was 50 cents a day for 12 hours or more of work a day, seven days a week. The foreman could kick your rear end and nothing could be done about it as there were no unions in those days. When the Americans went to build the railroads in Mexico, Uncle Tom Milan went too and took my father with him. And that's how my father started his Mexico railroad career. 
working his way up to master mechanic of the Mexican National Railroad and the Mexican Central Railroad. Mr. M.J. Snyder, a good friend of my father, was superintendent. The railroads in Mexico were operated in the English language, such as train orders, etc. Like track orders is another word he uses. Everything went along fine until one day the Mexican government nationalized and took over the railroads and passed a new law that the railroads were to be operated in the Spanish language. The American locomotive engineers protested and left their jobs, but it did not do any good. They were replaced by Mexican engineers. When the American engineers gave up their jobs, father was ready to return home to the United States. So he requested a leave of absence and we came to the United States. Father had planned on finishing work in the United States and staying here. But it wasn't long when they called him to return to his job in Mexico. So he returned to Mexico for an indefinite stay. While we were in the United States, we also visited my uncle, Captain John Tacky, and family in Galveston, Texas. Then we went to San Antonio, Texas. While in Galveston, when we were walking around town, we met a lady who knew father when she was a little girl because father had been her babysitter. She was real glad to see father. She said she was operating a boarding house and invited us to come and have dinner with her. In his early years in Mexico, father also worked in different parts of the country. In one part of the country, the flies were so bad that before you took a bite of bread, if you did not want to eat flies, you had to blow them off of your bread and then take a quick bite. At another part of the country where he worked, there was some kind of plague going on. He said one man would be talking to another when all of a sudden one of them would vomit blood and drop down dead. The doctor advised him to eat plenty of onions to help keep the plague away. Father also did some prospecting in the mountains in his spare time. One day when my father was pigeon hunting with his friend Jim Laval, Jim L. Laval in Mexico, he was about to go under a tree when he noticed there was a big jaguar crouching on the branches of a tree ready to pounce on whatever went under the tree. So he quietly got out of the way because he did not have any ammunition for shooting jaguars. He only had bird shot for shooting birds. Another time, my father and Mr. Lavelle went bathing at Tampico in the Gulf of Mexico. They used the word bathing for swimming back in those days. And you should have seen my father's head when he came home. It was full of water blisters. Sunburn. When we moved to the Monticello, Monticello house, somebody sold my father a couple of fawn deer. These deer were pets and liked to eat cigars. We used to play with them until they got big enough to stand on their hind feet and slash with their front feet. My mother did not like that because she was afraid they might hurt us. So she had them butchered and processed into venison. We also had a real nice talking parrot that played around free in the patio on a large bougainvillea plant. One day my brother John, while nobody was looking, decided to take a shot at the parrot with his BB gun and shot him right in the heart and that was the last of our talking parrot. <laughs> we had three young white rabbits we played with. One day they disappeared. We did not know what became of them. About the same time, my brother Henry became sick in bed. He is the youngest of my brothers. We couldn't make out what was wrong with him, so my mother called the doctor who came to the house. He checked him over, prescribed something, but could not tell what was wrong with him. About a couple of days later, we found the rabbits floating in a barrel of water. It was then that my brother Henry told mother that he had tried to reach the ra teach the rabbits how to swim and that they had gotten away from him and had drowned. The shock of it had made him very sick. Trouble started brewing in Europe and Germany was pressuring Mexico to start trouble with the United States. The United States learned about this, so they broke relations with Mexico. They recalled the American ambassador and all consuls. The Brazilian ambassador was left in charge of American affairs. The United States ordered some battleships and marines to take the port of Veracruz and prevent the unloading of big German ships loaded with war materials intended to be used against the United States. The United States Marines took Veracruz April 24, 
no, sorry, April 21st, 1914, and all American citizens were ordered to evacuate Mexico and return to the United States. During this troublesome time, Father and I took a walk through the town at night, and as we did, as we did so, we came upon a large group of people on a street corner listening to a man making a fiery speech provoking them against the Americans. We had not been there very long when a friendly Native American, our guardian angel, walked up to us, cautioned my father, and told us to move on as there was no telling what the people might do to us if they saw us. So we moved on. We left Mexico for the last time by rail to Mexico City. Father carried his automatic in his hip pocket. Fortunately, we were not searched and there were, there were no incidents on the way. After arriving at Mexico City, we went to the office of the Brazilian ambassador who was left in charge of American affairs for instructions and papers. While there, they asked Father if he was carrying any arms with him. So he told them about his automatic and he was told it was best to leave his automatic with them as it was too risky if he was found carrying an automatic weapon during this turmoil. So he left his automatic with the Brazilian ambassador. There was no communication between Mexico City and Veracruz, so while we were waiting at the station for a train to Veracruz, a young lady approached my mother with a letter to her boyfriend, from whom she had not heard from for some time, and begged mother to take it and mail it for her at Veracruz. Yes, mother took it and mailed it at Veracruz. We finally boarded the passenger train that was to take us towards Veracruz. We traveled all afternoon and all night, passing the city of Orizba and other towns until the next morning, when the train stopped somewhere in the jungle where the retreating Mexican army had pulled up the rails and ties for about four or five kilometers. This was about 50 kilometers from Veracruz. They had made several piles of ties along the right of way, placed the rails on top of them and set fire to them so that when the rails got hot, they became bent and warped and could not be used. When we got off the train, we saw there was a lone Mexican soldier armed with his rifle who must have been left there as a rear guard. There also was a man with a sleigh and a yoke of oxen who was for free hauled our luggage to the other end of the disrupted railroad. We walked trailing behind him. We waited for 30 or 40 minutes when suddenly there came a passenger train manned by U.S. Marines. They had machine guns set up in front of the locomotive. They had a baggage car rigged up for communication with wireless, etc., and an escort of Marines. We were taken on board and we headed for Veracruz. The Marines were friendly and Father talked with them. We arrived at Veracruz and found the town under martial law. The Marines had taken over the town. We stayed in a hotel for about two days in a room on the second floor that had a balcony overlooking the main part of town where you could see the Gulf. There were some battleships and other ships anchored some distance from the shore. While we were in the hotel, I stood on the balcony looking about to see what was going on. I saw a man standing on something in the middle of the street making a speech to a small crowd about him. All of a sudden, two Marine policemen, MPs, came over to get him. He ran into a horse-drawn coach, but there were some Marines on the other side of the coach ready to catch him when he came out. So they apprehended him and took him away. The Navy took us in a launch, which was operated by a small steam boiler, to board the SS Monterey. It felt funny aboard the ship, but we got used to it and enjoyed it. The ship was anchored some distance from shore. We would go to bed at night looking south and would wake up looking in another direction. It seems like the ship would pivot around the anchor. We stayed anchored for several days, I suppose waiting for some more evacuees, until one day they raised the anchor and started moving just as we sat down to eat supper. It sure made me sick, and I got up from the table right quick. I did not eat any supper that night. We sailed for Cotzacalos, Cuarto, Mexico, arriving there sometime the next day to pick up more evacuees at the docks. Some of these people were from San Luis Potosí, and we knew them. After this, we sailed to quarantine stations on the mouth of the Mississippi River. On the way, we met some clipper ships and other ships sailing on the Gulf of Mexico. We slept in tents that were raised above the water, had wooden floors, and were equipped with cots to sleep on. There were wooden walks to walk to the dining room where we were to eat our meals. There were alligators under the walkways 
but they did not bother us. We stayed at the quarantine point for about 10 days. Then we boarded the ship and had a smooth sail up the Mississippi and landed at Algiers, New Orleans. We took an open taxi across the river on a ferry boat to New Orleans. Then we, passed, we boarded a passenger train to Houston, Texas. On our way to Houston, we passed through De Quincey, Louisiana, where we saw a railroad shop. When father saw it, he said, I wish I had a job at this railroad shop, not knowing that one day he would become a general foreman in this very shop. From Houston, we took the Southern Pacific train for San Antonio. At San Antonio, we stayed at a rooming house on West Commerce Street for about two days. Then father rented a house on Burleson Street, not far from the Southern Pacific Railroad. My brothers John, Henry, and I were enrolled in the Davala School Number 3 on Austin Street. My sister Sophie was too young to start school. I was surprised to see the schoolyard divided up in two yards by a big board fence. One side was for the boys to play in and the other side for the girls to play in. There was a German teacher that came to our school twice a week to give lessons in German and singing lessons to our classes. The songs they taught were patriotic ones of Texas, such as The Eyes of Texas Are Upon You, Texas Land, and The Republic Hymn of Texas. Our principal's name was Mr. Harris. I don't remember the teacher's names. Anyway, we got along fine. On the same street we lived on about two houses away from us, a widow with some children. This woman baked bread every day and delivered it in a little wagon which she pulled along the street. There were very few automobiles, automobiles in those days, mostly horse-drawn vehicles, especially horse and buggy outfits. There were a few taxis, which they called jitneys. The jitney was a Model T Ford. These jitneys charged a nickel for a ride in town. There were also streetcars. The first money I made in my life was for watching a horse and buggy while the owners went shopping in town. They paid me a dime. These buggies sometimes would get a wheel locked in the streetcar rails and the wheel would break off. It cost a nickel for kids to go to a picture show and 10 cents for adults. These were silent pictures. On Saturdays, Sundays, or holidays, we would sometimes walk to Fort Sam Houston to watch the soldiers play baseball. Other times, we would walk to San Pedro Park to drink water from the spring, or we would walk to Breckenridge Park to see the animals in the zoo, or we would walk to town to go to do window shopping. That was life in San Antonio back in the day. There was an overpass over the Southern Pacific Railroad tracks, not too far from the house where we lived. So we decided to make us a little wooden wagon so we could coast down the incline. The wagon had wooden wheels and wooden axles and was made of apple crates. We took turns going down the incline, but it didn't last long. The wooden wheels rubbing on the wooden axles caught fire and burned. That was the end of our wooden wagon. My mother bought my little sister Sophie a two-wheel cart to haul her around. We would sit Sophie on the cart and would speed around the block with her. Sometimes we would be going too fast when we turned a corner and the centrifugal force was so great we would spill her out on, of the cart. We managed to save 50 cents and bought us a pair of skates at Chris's store. We took turns learning to skate on the sidewalk. There was a policeman that lived down the street from us. Every time we would see him coming, we would run into the house. His name was George Jackson. He also was a machinist, machinist and later, later on went to work in the shops at De Quincey, Louisiana. Go figure. One day while mother went shopping, my brother Henry set fire to a comb in the kitchen. When it burned his hand, he threw it away. The burning comb struck the kitchen window curtains and started them burning furiously. There was a pot of coffee sitting on the stove and my brother John grabbed it right quick and used the coffee to put out the fire. His quick thinking saved us from a big fire. Little boys. We had kind of a rough time in San Antonio. Father could not find any work. We were living on his savings. Then it happened that Mr. Jim Lavalle, father's friend from Mexico, had become general foreman for the Gulf Coast Lines Railroad at Kingsville, Texas. 
He knew my father was looking for work and gave him a job at the Kingsville shops. He worked there until he was laid off due to reduction of forces. We remained in San Antonio while father was away working. Then later on, Mr. Laval was promoted to master mechanic in De Quincey, Louisiana. Mr. Laval then called my father to come work at De Quincey. In December 1915, we all moved to De Quincey. And so it begins. Father had rented a house that stood where the parking lot of the First United Methodist Church now stands. It's funny because I parked in that parking lot a lot going to work there and didn't realize I was parking on the original spot where they first lived. About this time, my father was appointed general foreman. The water supply for this house and the next house, you know, next door house, was from a well that was located between the two houses. This was only a shallow well, about 12 to 15 feet deep. It did not produce enough water, so we had to carry water in buckets from a hydrant two and a half blocks away, provided by the railroad company for people who needed water. In those days, cattle were allowed to roam all over the place, and many of them bedded on the streets. People with a milk cow would pin up the cow at night and turn the calf out, and in the morning, turn the cow out to graze and open up, yeah, and pin up the calf. There was a livery stable where you could board or rent a horse. In the summer of 1917, Mr. Laval gave me a job in the shops helping a motor car machinist by the name of Slim Enders. This man later resigned and bought a farm in Fort Worth, Texas area. Copy. A word about Mr. Laval. He was a good talker, a very persuasive man, and knew how to influence people. He went to Mexico looking for work. At this time, father was a master mechanic. Father liked his friendliness and gave him a job. He told him if he made good, he would be promoted. Mr. Lavalle, well, I'm not sure if this is Laval or Lavalle. It's spelt two different ways in here. He made good and was promoted. Mr. Laval and father became real good friends. Father helped Mr. Laval in Mexico and Mr. Laval helped him over here. When Mr. Laval was appointed superintendent, he recommended father for the master mechanic job, but father turned it down. He wanted to remain in his old job. Later on, Mr. Laval obtained a position with the Texaco Oil Company. He worked his way up to assistant general manager of the Texaco Oil Company with offices in New York on 42nd Street. He had a son who was following in his footsteps in the oil company. This young fellow joined the Air Force in World War II and lost his life in the service. Later on, Mr. Laval dropped dead of a heart attack, just as he was going to enter his home at White Plains, New York. I continued to work in the shops during vacations. In the meantime, I became a machinist apprentice with a pay rate of 18 cents an hour. During World War I, a lot of people rushed to go work on high paying war jobs. The school janitor left two with three months left of school. The school authorities could not find anyone to replace the janitor so I was appointed janitor by the school principal. My brother Henry helped me with the job. We attended classes and after school, we cleaned the schoolrooms and school grounds. We also operated the big gas engine to pump water for school use. We also did all maintenance work, etc. I graduated from high school on June 3rd of 1920. A word, we Krugers can do just about anything. Just saying. There was a terrible storm in De Quincey in August 1918. This was a hurricane. It hit without warning as there were no radios or TV stations, no radar, no weather apps in those days to broadcast weather forecast. Father, my brother John and I were at work. The storm struck around midday. It brought, brought torrential rains and a powerful wind which lifted the roofs off some houses and destroyed others. It caused an enormous loss of timber by uprooting and splintering trees. The shops were flooded with timbers and lumber flying around, some of which pierced the reservoirs of kerosene, gasoline, and engine oil, then leaked out and floated on top of the water. The passenger train engine to Houston that same afternoon had a fire in the firebox after its engine stalled on the turntable. 
We were thankful the oil and gas floating on the water did not catch on fire or there would have been a bigger catastrophe. About half the shops, railroad shops, were destroyed. Train cars were pushed around by the wind. My brother John rode the storm out inside of a locomotive firebox together with one of the yellow boys that were working at the shop. I rode the storm out inside of the baggage compartment of a motor car we, we were working on. Father, who was general foreman, was around dodging the storm, trying to keep the shops in operation, which was a difficult thing to do in such a storm. It's safe to say I didn't inherit my fear of the storms from my great-grandfather, because he'd be out. He was out in it. I still got a job to do. Move out of the way, Hurricane. It's a Kroger thing. We were fortunate this storm happened in the summertime for the schools were almost destroyed with windows blown out and schoolroom seats scattered all over the country. The school water tank was blown by the storm into the shape of a closed umbrella. Our house was blown to the ground from its foundations. My mother, brother Henry, and sister Sophie, who were in the house at the time, were thrown out of the house. They couldn't stand up to walk because of the force of the wind, so they crawled on their hands and knees for two blocks until they came to a wire fence of the Aza Oda place. The Aza Otis family found them and gave them shelter throughout the remainder of the storm. When the storm subsided, John and I went home to find the damage and an empty house. We didn't know what had become of Mother Henry and Sophie until they came home bringing food which the Otis family had shared with them. I want to say the Otis house is the second place they went. Seems like I was told that at first they went to the nearest church would have like in the direction they were going I think was the Catholic church and then something the Holy Spirit spoke to my grandmother and said get out of there but, and they did and they went to the which would have been this this other place the Azota place and then something happened with that building they were in at the, the Catholic church John and I, after the storm was over, went home to find the damage in an empty house. We didn't know what had become of Mother Henry and Sophie until they came home bringing food which the Otis family had shared with them. Father stayed on the job and didn't come home till later. True Kroger. Needless to say, we moved to another house. The next day after the storm, we went back to work cleaning the debris left by the storm so the shop could open back and be working. There sure was a mess. And all us folks can understand that that have gone through the hurricanes. It was here in De Quincey that we learned to swim in some borrow pits and later on would hike to Beckwith Creek to swim. Borrow pits. I'm uncertain what this term means, but I'm guessing it must be from like dynamiting for dynamiting, maybe for lumber or whatever, the holes. When the church Sunday school had a picnic, it would usually be at Beckwith Creek. The preacher had a horse and buggy and would haul the goodies, a couple of big watermelons, and the ladies that had trouble walking. The preacher would make two trips in doing this. The watermelons were placed in the creek to cool off. The rest of us going to the picnic would hike to the creek. As far as I can remember, there wasn't any rationing of food or goods. If the supply was okay, you could buy anything you needed. If not, you just had to do without. They sold saving stamps and liberty bonds. When the war was over, there was a lot of celebrating, parading, whistle blowing, bell ringing, and shotgun shooting. One of the Garin boys was killed in the war. His body shipped to De Quincey, where he was buried in the Rig Maiden Cemetery with military honors. My brother Henry, who was a Boy Scout, played taps for him. In school during World War I, they taught us patriotic songs. One went like this. North, East, South, and West, our country calls you to be true to the red, white, and blue. United we stand, divided we fall. A free sea and land means freedom for all. So show your colors bravely, each maiden man, a true United Nation, proud American. Another went like this. America, I love you. You're like a sweetheart of mine. From ocean to ocean, for you my devotion shows no boundary line. 
just like a little baby sitting upon its mother's knee. America, I love you, and there's a hundred million others like me. How many woke people would be offended by that? In 1922, a hundred years ago, as of this year, the railroad shopmen were ordered to strike against the railroads by the union officers. Father didn't like to see this strike because he knew they were going to lose it. So all went out on strike. Father went out too. Even though he, he knew they were going to lose, he went out too. Stood on principle. It took three months to finally settle the strike unconditionally in favor of the railroads. So we lost the strike. We all returned to work except Father. Mr. Choate, the manager of the railroad, refused to let him return to work. Father had been a foreman. He was without work for close to a year. Father wanted to talk to Mr. Choate about a job whenever he came to visit the De Quincey shops. Nobody would let Father know when Mr. Choate was coming. Until one day, a new back shop foreman, a Mason, who had found out Father was a Mason, told me to go home and tell Father that Mr. Choate was coming to the shops that day. I went and told Father. Ah. Father talked to Mr. Choate and persuaded him to let him return to work. Father had gone out on the strike as an example to his sons. Other foremen who remained on the job during the strike were eventually replaced by new men. The De Quincey newspaper editor was jailed for siding with the strikers. I believe his name was Shanks. He was held in the old 8x8 De Quincey jail. The people felt sorry for him and would bring him food and other treats. I do not remember how long he was held, but it wasn't very long. Some time after I finished my machinist apprenticeship, I obtained a leave of absence from the railroad and articulated, articulated, I'm not sure what that word means, but he enrolled in Rice University at Houston. I am only sorry to say that I didn't even get to stay a whole semester because I had already railroaded too long and got homesick for my work. I resigned and went back to work. Do what you are led to do. If you are led to go to school and that's where you feel like you should be, yes. If you enroll in college, even though you don't really feel deep down that's what you're supposed to do, then do what it said. Go back to work. That's what he wanted to do. I enjoyed laying off shoes and wedges on a steam locomotive because it constituted the use of straight lines, arcs, circles, and right angles, which I had learned in geometry. I like to operate the different kinds of machines, making parts for the locomotives, etc., doing cab work and air work. Then came the Great Depression during the Hoover administration. A lot of people were out of work and starving. They traveled aimlessly from town to town and state to state, only to find the same problem going on. There were big signs at the city limits of towns that used to say, welcome to our town. Now they said, no migrants or vagrants allowed, keep moving. People ate a lot of armadillos in those days, that's why they called them Hoover Hogs. Many people sold apples in the street. There were long soup lines in the cities. The stock market went way down and many investors suffered heavy losses. Some investors even committed suicide. The shops kept just enough men to keep the trains running. Some men were laid off and others worked part-time when needed. It was during the depression that we moved to Pine Acres subdivision in De Quincey. Boop. Here, we did a little farming we raised some peas, beans, corn, Irish and sweet potatoes, some other vegetables, a few chickens and turkeys, a couple of hogs, and a milk cow. How much I would love to turn this place into a farm again, but that's just me. We did our work. I with horsepower. We also did some canning and meat curing. It helped us out during the Depression, especially when we were not working. Yes, the Depression was a terrible thing. At the end of Hoover's term, Franklin Delano Roosevelt became president. The first thing he did was to close all the banks and froze all money deposited in the banks. You needed your money, but you couldn't get it. The federal government checked the affairs of all banks and all those found in good condition were permitted to reopen. Just before the banks closed, Father had transferred his savings from a bank in Laredo, Texas to the Calcasieu National Bank because the local management assured him that it was the safest institution in the South. Father did not live to collect his money. 
the bank in Laredo was in good shape and was allowed to reopen and continue business. President Roosevelt started his New Deal. There was the Conservation Corps, which youth joined to work in federal projects for their room and board, plus a little spending money. Then there was the Works Progress Administration, the WPA, in which men took turns to work on public projects for a dollar a day. The poor people were also provided with some free food items. Finally, things began improving during the Roosevelt administration until we got involved in World War II. The Calcasieu National Bank was taken over by Mr. Burton, who borrowed money from the federal government to pay off the depositors. So the people finally got their money after a long time. The bank was reorganized and renamed the Calcasieu Marine National Bank. This was done by Mr. W.T. Burton. During World War II, De Quincey built a watchtower so people could watch for airplanes flying overhead and report them to the proper authorities. I was assigned to take turns at night on this tower and received an Air Force button for taking part. We also had an emergency first aid class and instructions on how to take care of ourselves in case of an air raid. During World War II, practically everything was rationed. A lot of things you could not get even if they were rationed or not. Among the things that were rationed were practically all kinds of food products, especially meat products of all kinds, shoes, gasoline. You could buy inner tubes, but not buy tires. New automobiles were reserved for government use and doctors. You could not buy any watches, clocks, wire fence, and most hardware. Building materials were hard to come by. All this in order to have materials and food for the United States fighting men and her allies against the enemy. President Roosevelt died during the war and Vice President Harry Truman took over as President of the U.S. About the same time, the atom bomb was perfected and Mr. Truman ordered it dropped at Hiroshima, Japan. Japan quickly surrendered and that helped out a, put a quick stop to the war. Father was sick in bed just before the Second World War began and he grieved. He was very depressed when he read in the papers about the concessions of weak countries Mr. Chamberlain was giving Hitler. Mr. Chamberlain was Prime Minister of England, and he thought by letting Hitler invade the weak countries, war between England and Germany would be prevented by the appeasement. This was a big mistake. Father almost wept as he said, why doesn't somebody do something about it? Father died on April 1st, 1940, before World War II started. Later, Winston Churchill became Prime Minister Minister of England and between him and the rest of our people during that time we eventually kicked Hitler's butt. Some of the people that worked under father when he was master mechanic in Mexico had trouble in getting their pensions from the railroad because the railroad offices had burned down and they claimed the men's records had burned up too. So the men wrote father asking for his help to get their pensions Father helped them all. Among them was a letter from a man who Father said had tried to actually truly kill him. But all Father said was, let's help him get his pension too. And that's the kind of man Father was. The Father I had was a good man. We were also blessed with a good Christian mother who taught us just as soon as we could talk how to say our prayers. She would have us kneel beside her. And that's how we learned to say our prayers. She always took care, good care of us. During the 1918 flu epidemic, the Spanish flu, their version of our CV, when the whole family except mother caught the flu at the same time, she took care of us and nursed us all five back to health again. She didn't get sick. Moms can't get sick. Moms got to take care of everybody. Mother died April 6, 1944. During the Second World War, I was assigned to the tool room. I had charge of the tool room and had to repair all tools used in the shop, maintain all the shop machinery, water pumps, the boiler washing equipment, the roundhouse drop pit jack, the overhead cranes, the portable cranes, the locomotive jacks and hoists, the car department jacks, the mill machinery, the powerhouse machinery, the time clock, the blacksmith shop machines, the turntable, the wrecker, the pile driver, the brown hoist, and others. I had to keep records and make out orders for tools needed and for repair parts for machines. 
Then the diesels came and the shops were converted from steam locomotives to diesel locomotives. The shop machines were sold, some were moved away, and after 10 years of working in the tool room, my tool room job was abolished and I was assigned to working on diesels. Many men were laid off and only a skeleton crew kept, was kept to keep things going until eventually the whole shop was closed down and I lost my job. This happened about the time my son Mylan was attending McNeese State University. My other children were attending the De Quincey schools. I was out of work for several months. I was wearing my car out, spending money on gas, looking for work in the Beaumont and Orange area. Other companies were laying off men instead of hiring. One day, Mr. Lewis Martin, who was a mason and a shriner with whom Conductor Russell and I had attended some shrine meetings, found out that I was out of work. He and Mr. Raymond Wilrich came, came and told me to come over to the Seta gas shops and see him. Mr. Martin has been appointed to Master Mechanic of the Missouri Pacific Railroad Shops at Setter Gas, Houston, Texas, is what they had told him. I made a trip to Houston and went to see Mr. Martin. At that time, they were not permitted to hire anyone except those who were laid off. I and GN employees. But Mr. Martin spoke with management and persuaded them to give me a job. So I went to work and stayed there for about 10 years until I retired June 1st, 1967, after about 51 years of being connected to the railroad. And I will, I've got this here letter that was written to my grandfather on February 21st, which happens to be my birthday, February 21st, 1977. And about a month later, my grandfather passed away. All right, the Groth letter. Mr. Groth was living in New York at the time that he wrote this letter to my grandfather right before he passed away. Um, his name was William we, Bill Groth. So the Groths are our cousins. Though I don't know any of them. I did miss, meet Mr. Bill Groth and I met his brother. Uh, it's been a very long time ago. Dear Cousin Peter, thank you for your letter on January 28th. The name Kroger is familiar to me. My mother often spoke of Henry Kroger. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe that I received mail from a Kroger while I was stationed in the Philippine Islands with the Navy during World War II. But would be us. As near as I can figure it, I understand that your mother's mother was a Willig, a sister to my grandmother, Johanna Hermina Gerdina Willig Tacky, born on January 12, 1817, in Bremerhaven, Lily County, Germany, to William Willig, a carpenter by trade and Johanna Willig nee Damstadt. I am William John Groth, Jr., born August 8, 1926, in, Ard in Ardsley, New York, to William John Groth and jo jo Johanna Marie Groth, nee Tacky. I have been a police officer for 23 years, now a lieutenant. The coffee spell. I'm the seventh child in a family of 10 children. None of, nine of the children survive and, and are living here in north, the northeast part of the country. I have often thought of trying to trace the family lineage, but never really went, went to work on it. Fortunately, on two prior occasions, when this desire came upon me, June 5, 1962 and February 25, 1967, I took time to sit with my mother, Johanna, and I made some hurried notes as we spoke about my ancestry. They may have pronounced her name Johanna. Johanna would have been the German way. They probably, her parents probably called her that. But I'm guessing in New York they could have called her either one. And I made some hurried notes as we spoke about my ancestry. I wish I had taped our conversation for accuracy, but I'm grateful for what I have, and perhaps by sharing this with you, I may learn a great deal more. 
I hope that this may be the beginning of a new revelation and I will be pleased if you can add to it and return any information you might, may receive from your son. I think he's referring to my Uncle Mylan because at the time my Uncle Mylan I think may have been stationed in Germany. Now if my grandfather managed to get a letter to him before he passed away I don't know. I mean I don't remember it because it's been a long time ago. Going back as far as I can, my grandfather on my mother's side was John Frederick Tacky. And that would have been the great great uncle of mine in Galveston. He was born in Alsace, Alsace Lorraine, Prussia on May 24th, 1844. And Prussia, I believe, is now part of northern Germany. That borders Russia. His family were farm people. At the age of 18, in 1862, he left Prussia and went to Holland where he stayed with cousins. He was taken with the sea and went to sea as a sailor, finally settling in Galveston, Texas. He enjoyed his bachelorhood until 1888 when he married Johanna Hermina Gerdina Willig. He was captain of a small sailing vessel with a crew of three, which plied the waters of the Gulf of Mexico between Galveston, Mobile, Key West, and New Orleans. My mother and only child frequently went with him on one to two week voyages, carrying lumber, grain, etc. John Tacky had a sister named Marie and two brothers, Henry and another he could not remember his name. Henry was shot through the face in the Franco-Prussian War, but lived to return to the farm on a government pension. John left Prussia for Holland at the age of 18, probably because of his hate of the war that injured his brother Henry. John's sister, Marie, the youngest, was a seamstress. My mother didn't say much about her, although my mom's middle name came from John's sister. John lost a small fortune in, bank, in a bank failure prior to his marriage and was disheartened. He returned to Germany in the 1880s to see his mother and perhaps to live, but she died before his arrival. And he came back to America where he met Johanna Willig and married her in 1888. After his marriage, John settled down with his bride at 33rd Street and Avenue G in Galveston, Texas. His only child, Johanna Marie, my mother, was born in that house on October 18th of 1892. In 1893, the family moved to another home a few blocks away at 33rd Street and Avenue M. I wonder at times if it was Avenue M or M Street because I remember Grandma Tacky speaking of M Street. They were named at that address through the great flood, giant hurricane, of 1900 and were spared from the tragedy that took the lives of several relatives the Rim and Schuylers, along with about 3,000 other people. John Tacky's ship, the Helena, was disabled and had to be blown up to clear a channel. John Tacky bought another ship, the Silas, which he lost in a storm off Veracruz, Mexico. He was rescued by the Coast Guard and returned to Galveston, broke in 1901. This dude's a survivor. Not many people's ship gets blown around in a second hurricane, gets lost in a second hurricane, and you're in the water, but you survive. This dude's pretty, pretty rugged. Although his fortune was gone, he still owned his home. He took his family to Hastings on Hudson, New York in 1901 seeking employment. The Tacky family stayed with the Groth family at 516 Broadway from April to October 1901, but John had no success finding employment. John's wife and Gustav Groth's wife, Wilhelmina, were sisters. John was 56 years old at the time. The Tacky family returned to Galveston where John took a job as a watchman. The family continued to do to live at 33rd and M Street. John Tacky died of natural causes in Texas in April of 1922, 100 years ago, as of this year. My mother spoke of the rheumatism and crippling arthritis that had affected him. So he also had seriously bad crippling arthritis, been all back and forth across the, the ocean, 
to Germany, to Galveston, Germany and Galveston again, to New York, back to Galveston, working the, the two ships, both lost in a hurricane. One, he actually was blown out of the ship and rescued. The struggle was real, and he struggled through with this arthritis, a survivor. John Tacky had met Gustav Aldolf Groth, my grandfather on my father's side, while the two of them sailed the Atlantic during the early careers as sailors. Gustav was born in 1845. I don't know where he was born, but he became engaged to Wilhelmine Willig when he was about 33 years old. Wilhelmine was born and reared in Bremerhaven. Could it be that Gustav also lived nearby, or did he happen to meet her there on one of his voyages? Bremerhaven was a busy port, and such a meeting would certainly have been possible. Gustav kept the engagement going for 10 years before he married Wilhelmine 10 years later in Mount Vernon, New York, after sending for her to come to America. Oh, engagement. It seems that he was a sailor for the entire 10 years of their courtship. Wilhelmine was a, the older sister of my grandmother, Johanna Willig Tacky. Gustav's father was a doctor. The doctor died when Gustav was just two years old. He was married out of his class and was disinherited because of it. He had a difficult time economically. Gustav Groth had two or three brothers and sisters of which nothing is known at this time. Gustav, like John Tacky, went to... Gustav, like John Tacky, went... Sorry. Went to work when he was about 18 years old as a sailmaker. He was acquainted with a family by the name of Von Hein of Mount Vernon, New York. Mr... Von Hein ran a tavern in New York City and Gustav frequented the place. Gus being a seafaring man, the tavern may have been where he met the Von Heins, but it was also possible that he knew them from Germany. Gustav married Wil Wilhelmine Willig in Mount Vernon, New York on or about 1888. He left her with the Von Heins in Mount Vernon, New York while he continued seafaring. What a patient woman. He quit the seafaring for a short time and went to live in Hastings on Hudson, New York, where he became employed as a caretaker on the Zinzer estate, west side of Broadway, Hastings on Hudson. Zinzer was of the family who operated the Zinzer Chemical and Dye Works in Hastings on the riverfront. Gustav set up housekeeping with Wilhelmine on Main Street, Hastings, in a small apartment beneath Jeffers Hardware Store. The entrance to the apartment was from the valley behind the store south of Main Street. It was in this apartment that their first child was born in 1890. He was named after his father, Gustav Adolf. A second son, my father, was born on November 18, 1893 in the same apartment. These were their only two children. My father's brother, Gus, remained a resident of Hastings all of his life. He married a woman named Ida and they had seven children who have spread throughout the country. Ida was born in 1896 and died in 1958. Uncle Gus died in 1952. Gustav Adolf and his wife Wilhelmine moved to Dorland's Cottage, which was just across Main Street from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church. My father, William J. Groth, was about seven years old at the time. Gustav worked with Zilsner and was somewhat seasonal and lean times. Lost my place. During the winter months, when gardening at the Zinzir estate came to a standstill, Gustav worked for a while in the Department of Public Works in Hastings and then got a job with the National Conduit and Cable Company in 1903 or 1904. He continued to work here until his death in 1915. It was about this time that the family moved to 516 Broadway in Hastings. I'm not sure whether this move came before or after his death. According to a newspaper account of this death, my grandfather Gustav Adolf Groth took his own life on August 16, 1915 because of his mental depression over the war against his homeland. My mother disputes this and says that there was ample evidence to indicate that he was murdered, perhaps by an anti-German fellow employee. 
His death occurred at 7 a.m. at the National Conduit and Cable Company, later Anaconda Company, where he worked as a watchman in his latter years. It is alleged that he shot himself in the head with his revolver. His wife, Wilhelmine, remained in Hastings until her death on February 8, 1926. She must have worked hard and saved diligently during her last years. My father often spoke of the difficult times they had economically, but when Grandma Groth died, she owned a home, had fully paid for a large family burial plot and monument, left each of her two sons several thousand dollars and left an endowment of six hundred dollars for each of her fourteen grandchildren, which was no small feat in those days. That's a no small feat now. She must have been very frugal and very smart financially. As I stated before, both of my grandmothers were for, from Brimmerhaven. They were sisters, Johanna, Hermina, Gerdina, Willig, Tacky, I probably butchered her name. My mother's side was born on January 12, 1870. Her sister, Wilhelmine, my father's mother, was about 10 years earlier in 1861. Their birthplace is identified as Bremer Haven, Lehi County, Germany. Their parents were William Willig, a carpenter, and his wife, Johanna Willig, nays Damstadt. Their thir 13 children were born, but only six survived to adulthood. 13 times given birth. No pain medication. The women were tough. They were tough. One son, and then they losing that many children too. Tough. Women were tough. One son, Carl, died at the age of 21 from tuberculosis. The remaining five were all girls. Frederica married a Herman Rolfs. Gerzina was put up for adoption by a wealthy relative that was childless. A childless couple adopted her. Lisa went to America, Galveston, with her husband, William Ream, leaving her three-year-old son behind with the grandparents. And I think they got killed in that hurricane. Johanna, my grandmother on my mother's side, brought the boy, William, to Galveston about seven years later for the Reams. Johanna stayed with the Reams in Galveston until she married John Frederick Tacky on February 11, 1888, in Galveston. It's hard to say how John Tacky met Johanna Willig, but it should be noted that Gustav Groth, a friend of John Tacky, knew Johanna's sister Willamine many years earlier. Another sister, Lily, the youngest of the surviving Willig children, came over to Galveston when she was about 17 years old. She stayed with Johanna Tacky Nee Willig until she married Charles Scheller. The Schellers have five children. Lily and the five children perished in the 1900 flood in Galveston. Okay, they're the ones that died in the flood. Maybe the rooms didn't. Uh, it's kind of confusing. Charles left Texas for Alaska. Oh, so they all died, but the dad didn't. So he left for Texas for Alaska to join the gold rush in Klondike. Nothing more is known of him. Bless his heart. Johanna Tacky Nee Willig survived her husband by 42 years. She remained in Galveston for three years after his death in 1922 at the age of 78. She owned her home at 33rd Street and Avenue M and I believe had some holdings in a lumber company in Galveston. In 1925, she moved to New York to be with her daughter, the other Johanna, who by now had five children. One died in infancy. She did a great deal to help her daughter in her new home at 57 Ridge Road, Arsley, New York. The, the home was under construction on her arrival and the family was living in a temporary building uh, under rather primitive conditions. They had moved into a one-story shed on August 21st, 1925, then occupied the home on October 31st, 1925. It was a tough winter and Johanna Taki's sister, Willa, Willamine Groth, died on February 8, 1926, at the age of 65. Johanna Willig Taki lived for another 38 years with the Groth family at 57 Ridge Road in Ardsley. I have fond memories of this little old woman. She was like a second mother to me and my four brothers and four sisters. She was there, I guess, to help my mother when I was born at 57 Ridge Road on August 8, 1926. I recall vaguely hauling some of her belongings up the hill on a wagon. They had come by rail a few years after her arrival in Ardsley. I guess Grandma Tacky had just come for a visit in 1925 because her personal treasures, old pictures, and large frames, I remember, 
and an old travel trunk came from Texas when I was a toddler, maybe three years old or so. It would be easy to write a book about this wonderful little old lady, about five feet tall and 90 pounds. She was cook, washwoman, nurse, housekeeper, gardener, babysitter, nurse, arbitrator, and everything else rolled into one. And that would be my And she'd be my cousin. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a feisty another survivor. Well, her like dad was a survivor. She never did get a good handle on the English language, and so she really couldn't tell us much about her ancestors. She was deeply religious and most of all very loving and protective. Aside from a perpetual wall that seemed to exist between, between her and my father, I never heard her voice a harsh word about anyone. She never criticized him in my presence, but he seemed to dislike her strongly, and she was pained by it. Well, enough of that tangent, or I'll never get this finished. Grandma Tacky died during the winter of 1964, January 23, 1964, at the age of 94. What a woman. She'll always be immortal to me. Johanna Marie Groth, nee Tacky, was born to John Frederick Tacky and Johanna Willig Tacky on October 18, 1892 at 33rd Street and Avenue G, Galveston, Texas. In 1893, the family moved a few blocks to 33rd Street and Avenue M. I think he's summarizing the story. And this was her home until she got married. She graduated from high school in 1910 and went to study at the University of Texas where she obtained a teacher's certificate. This was not a full degree course in those days, but she did become assistant to a school principal before her marriage to her cousin, William John Groth, on October, no, sorry, on August 23, 1917. Her parents were vehemently opposed to the marriage, perhaps because of the cousin relationship, but they eloped after a short courtship. My mother never spoke much about her childhood, except to reminisce fondly about her father, the sea captain. She mentioned short sea voyages with him on the Helena and spoke of his celebrations at the end of a voyage when he got paid for the trip and would have a party with his crew, often spending the entire payment in one night. He still was a survivor. You could spend your whole pay in one night partying and get through all the stuff he did, you're a survivor. Mom spoke of her mother. Grandma Tacky, as the master of the house, who went down to the docks to await Grandpa Tacky's return, intercepting him before he reached the bar and spent all of his money. Mom spoke of the terror of the 1900 flood, when the family stayed on the second floor of their modest frame house on 33rd Street as the waters rose eight feet to the level of the floor they were standing on, and then receding, leaving thousands of bodies on the streets and benches, beaches, streets and beaches, why the bench? She was only seven years old at the time. I guess it was just one year later when she met her cousin, Bill, and Hastings. I wonder if she ever dreamed she would marry him then. Mom frequently spoke of the Krogers in Louisiana, a Henry Kroger, great-grandpa for me. I believe she apparently visited the Krogers on occasion with her parents. I think she spoke of trips to Baton Rouge. I believe that it was the Krogers who would send her large bags of pecans during the 40s and 50s. Um, right back all up in here. Oh, you can't see it, but there's pecan trees, and that was from those pecan trees. Now, these pecan trees do not really produce anymore. They're so old, but there used to be a pecan orchard. She, al she also mentioned a Kroger family in Mexico. I don't know how they were related. She also spoke of her Aunt Lily Willig, who married Charles Scheller in Texas, and how Charles Scheller, after the loss of his family in the 1900 flood, joined the gold rush to the Klondike in Alaska. Johanna Marie Groth suffered a massive stroke in 1969. She did not regain consciousness for several weeks and remained an invalid for three years, completely bedridden. At times, she was quite lucid and spoke briefly in short, intelligible sentences, and at other times she did not appear to be aware of her surroundings. I don't know whether her sight was also affected. While she always recognized me during hospital visits, except on her last day, I think sometimes she recognized me simply by voice. It was obvious that she suffered great mental torment, being unable to express herself fully. 
Years after her death, I have been able to piece together some of the things she was trying to tell me. In spite of this torment, I thought she had an entirely different outlook on life during her disability. She seemed to be far more gracious and at ease with her acquaintances. She never doubted that she would recover until she gave up about three months before her death. She spoke to me about Henry Kroger during her hospitalization, at times almost as if she had had a very recent conversation with him, although I could not really understand what she was saying. Perhaps she had been dreaming. Mom was just one month short of her 80th birthday when she died September 18, 1972. William John Groth, my father, was born November 18, 1893 to Gustav Adolf Groth and Wilhelm Willeg Groth in a small apartment on Main Street, Hastings on Hudson, New York. He was a handsome lad, fair-haired and fair-skinned, blue eyes, a tetonic specimen. He was the youngest of two brothers. His older brother, Gus, was of the darker complexion. In a short conversation with my uncle Gus many years ago, Gus intimated that Pop was his mother's pet. My mother confirmed this. William attended grammar school a few doors away from his home in what became a firehouse, an old wooden building on the south side of Main Street a few doors from St. Matthew's Lutheran Church. He did well in school and exhibited a great talent for sales at an early age. Mom says he sold newspapers and soap at the age of eight, about when she first met him, and was extremely competitive and aggressive during sales contests. She pointed out how he brooded over a lost newspaper sales contest for many years. He continued his education in the Farragut High School, which is still in service today, although the building has been enlarged. He has many part-time jobs, the fish market, cutting lawns, caddying, etc. His school curriculum was in the business area, and he worked nights in the legit Rexall store in Getty Square, Yonkers, New York. I remember going into that store with him as a youngster. He used to go there for sales, but there seemed to be something nostalgic about his visits now that I think of it. He had reached his senior year in high school, and when some friends offered him a clerical job with Metropolitan Life Insurance in New York City, he quit school before graduating and went to work full-time. This was about 1910. He moved on to other jobs in the business world of New York City, attending business schools at the Cooper Union. He had become accomplished in shorthand and typing. When the World War broke out, he was working for Parsons and Whittemore Paper Company in New York City and he established himself well in the sales department. He became engaged to a Helen Minsler of Brooklyn, where, whose aunt and uncle owned a bar. He had proposed to Yo Johanna Tacky in 1913, but she turned him down. She was doing well in her teaching career, and her mother, Johanna, opposed marriage to anyone, let alone to Bill Groth. Pop's father died as a reported suicide on August 16, 1915. He was 70 years old. According to mom, Pop found Helen acting improperly with another man in the bar in 1917, and he broke the engagement. As a youngster, I had heard that it was Helen who broke the engagement, and Pop then married mom on the rebound. Pop was concerned about the draft for World War I. According to mom, he was thinking of going to Mexico to beat the draft. It seems that he thought about living with the Krogers in Mexico. They were relatives known to mom. One day in 1917, Mom got a telegram from Pop that he was on his way to Galveston. He arrived, stayed with John and Johanna Taiki, and got a job with the Santa Fe Railroad. He resigned from his New York job and decided to live in Galveston. Mom and Pop eloped on August 23, 1917, and went back to Hastings, New York, where they lived briefly at 516 North Broadway with Pop's mother. He returned to his old job with Parsons and Whitmore Paper Company in New York City and moved on to an apartment next to the Von Hines on South Bleecker Street, Mount Vernon, New York. This was the same family where Pop's father, Gustav Adolf Groth, lived when he got married in 1888. It seems that these people might have been relatives. On July 31, 1918, their first child, Dorothy Alma, was born in Mount Vernon Hospital. In 1919, Pop and Mom moved back to his mother's house at 516 Broadway in Hastings. On October 8, 1919, a son, Wilmer, was born in the Dobbs Ferry Hospital. He died just about six months later on March 16, 1920, of an apparent attack of diphtheria. Irma Louise was born on December 7, 1920, in the Dobie Ferry Hospital. It was about this time that my father was severely burned in an episode that had news people referring to him as a human torch. He was under his Model T Ford, heating a frozen carburetor with a burning newspaper while unknown to him, gasoline was dripping on his body. He became engulfed in flames. 
The injuries required skin grafts on his arm. I remember how badly his arm was scarred. Mom says that his lungs were damaged too. She thinks that this had something to do with his early death from cancer. He, he left his inside work at Parsons and Whitmore and took a job with Sheffield Milk Company as a route salesman. Later, he went to the Board of Milk Company where he remained until his death. It was June of 1921, four years after his marriage, when he took mom and daughters Dot and Ernie on a boat trip to Galveston. The trip took nine days by boat from New York to Galveston, and they stayed with mom's folks for three weeks and then returned to New York by train. One wonders how he managed to take a month's vacation at that time, and may have been during his convalescence from the fire before he went to work for the milk company. Dot and Ernie were only grandchildren that jo the only grandchildren that John Tacky saw. John Tacky saw only two grandchildren. He died in April of 1922. Mom made no mention of going to the funeral. Another son, John William, was born January 12, 1922, Grandma Tacky's birthday. Old John Tacky must have known about the birth, and it must have pleased him to have a grandson named after him before he died in, at the age of 78. John was born at 516 Broadway in Hastings. Alfreda Edna was born February 27, 1923, in Hastings, as was Adolf Frederick on September 24, 1924. Mom and Pop moved to Ardsley on August 24, 1925, and Grandma Wilhelmine Groth died on February 8, 1926. That's a little repetitive. I was the first child, William John Jr., to be born in the new house on August 8, 1926. He kind of writes like in a report in summary format, but he was a police detective, so I'm thinking he's writing his reports this way. Gustav Harrell was born November 4, 1928, and Henry Howard on June 15, 1930. Jo Joanne Lorraine, the baby of the family, was born on September 1, 1931. I remember the births of Henry and Joanne at the house on Ridge Road. To the best of my knowledge, the last four children were born with a midwife attending, a Mrs. Zebrock from Hastings, I think. My parents' marriage was a stormy one. That's just thrown in there. Pop's work was primarily at night. Although he seemed to love his work, it often made him quite a grouch, probably from lack of sleep. He was a hard worker and seldom, if ever, lost a day's work from the milk business, no matter how sick he might have been. He was a strict disciplinarian, and occasionally his children claimed present-day disabilities or misfortunes as a result of his sternness. This may have been true to some extent in a social sense, as he was, as he was an isolationist when at home. He severely restricted social activities for his daughters in their formative years and forbade visitors to his home on Ridge Road. My mother was more liberal and offset his restrictive measures somewhat with her involvement in church activities. This led to some social contact for the children at Sunday school. Pop thoroughly believed that idleness was the devil's workshop, and he seemed to think that reading anything but a textbook was simple. I remember many times how he would assign us to make work projects immediately if he found us reading. The older children of the family saw tougher times when the younger, I think, than the younger, I think. We went through our adolescence during the very difficult 1930s, the years of the Great Depression. But this was offset by the companionship and love we felt for one another as a family. Pop and Mom always seemed to get along best when they were faced with difficult times. When things got better for them in the 40s, the family fell apart. By the time I reached my teens, 1939, the older children were already out to work and Mom and Pop didn't pay too much attention to the younger ones anymore. They seemed to be wrapped up in problems involving their personal relationship, and while the war raged through the 1940s, they made war at home. Somehow, we all survived without catastrophe, and the youngest, Joanne, was already 22 years old when Pop died on April 15, 1954, after a short bout with cancer. He was just a few months over 60. We have many fond memories of the joys we shared together. Mom never forgot a birthday, and as youngsters, we have always celebrated Christmas with something under the tree for everyone. We remember the family song fest with mom at the piano, the family swim parties in the Hudson River, the hiking trips with the family dog, the many work or busy projects around the old home, and of course, our Sunday to go to church ritual. Of course, we remember the tough times and the unpleasant things, but the human mind seems to have a great capacity to help us forget these as the years roll by, and we have much to be thankful for. Good attitude, right thinking. So here we are, nine brothers and sisters with a total of almost five centuries of life among us. 
got Dot, Ernie, Johnny, Freddy, or Freddy, Fred, Bill, and Gus. Back then, they were mid-age, like my age and older, mid-ish, 50s, mid-40s. Henry and Honey. Now, these, I'm pretty sure, have all passed away at this point. My father's brother, Gus, has seven children, seven of whom live nearby. There's six boys, one girl, and grandchildren who would bear the name Groth. Admittedly, this is quite a conglomeration of information. It may well be a basis for someone to write a more organized family history, a project which I think I could be feasible with, with some cooperation of all concern. After all, this writing covers a period of well over a century and the lives of more than 100 people. I am sending you a duplicate copy, which you can forward to your son, the U.S. Army Major in Germany, if you wish. I will be pleased to hear from both of you with whatever information you can offer. Some of my information is sketchy, and some may not be authentic. Your notes will help me correct this. Once again, thanks for writing. I'll be in anticipating, I'll be anticipating your mail. Sincerely, William Groth, Jr. Bill. And then my grandfather, like I said, died less than a month after that letter's dated. Oddly enough, that letter is dated on my own personal birthday, you know, date-wise. And guess who's been the family historian since the 90s? That would be me. So maybe that's, it was like a little foreshadowing. And maybe I've got some cousins out there that could tell me more stories or know more things. I don't know. It'd be awesome to find them, though. You can never have too much family.